um, in, under the blood covenant. We're going to be dealing with a title calling the, called The Cleansing of the Leper. And uh, I included this uh, in this study because of the, the parallels with uh, the process in Leviticus chapter 14 and uh, the blood covenant that we have with Jesus Christ um, through the crucif crucifixion and resurrection. And so uh, we've talked in here before about how the Old Testament, it was a foreshadow of what God was going to do. The law pointed out our sin. A lot of the things in the, uh, the rituals of the temple or the tabernacle, the sacrifices, those were types and shadows of things that the Messiah was going to fulfill or perform. So if you have your Bibles or your uh, Bible apps, if you'll turn to Leviticus chapter 14, uh, verse 2 is where we're going to start. And we're going to read quite a bit. Well, actually, we're going to read down to, uh, I think, verse 9 or 10. So uh, Leviticus 14, uh, we'll just start at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. And the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. He who is to be clean shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water, that he may be clean. After that he shall come into the camp, and shall stay outside of his tent for seven days. But on the seventh day he shall shave all the hair off his head, and his beard, and his eye, eyebrows, and all the hair he shall say, shave off. He shall wash his body and wash his body in water, or his clothes, and then his body in water, and he shall be clean. I want to stop there, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer over this word and just ask him to open our hearts and our ears. Father God, we pray, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts and open our hearts and our ears to hear and to speak uh, what uh, you, are, you are trying to speak to us through your word and by your spirit. Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise for all that you have done and that you're doing. And we pray, Father, that you would bring illumination and revelation to us, uh, understanding, God, as we look at your word in dealing with this blood covenant. We give you glory and honor in his mighty name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Now, the reason that we're talking about this within the, the framework or the confines of the blood covenant is that God had entered into a covenant with Israel. They had accepted that covenant. This was part of the, part of the law, or what we would say, the, the rules of the covenant. What the, God clearly defined what He required of them and what He would do for them. Now, when we look at the law of the leper in the day of His cleansing in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 2, uh, we have an understanding leprosy was an incurable skin disease. Um, it could be manifested in several different ways, but the one that we know of, uh, it, theologians think that it could have been a variety of skin diseases. Uh, but it's one of the things you have to take into account, because today, if you're talking about leprosy and lepers, we do have drugs that can uh, cure leprosy, and, and you can be uh, healed in that fashion. But in that day, they didn't have uh, the, the pharmaceuticals or any of the things that and in a lot of if you look at the laws of Moses a lot of the things that God required were for the protection and the health of the children of Israel uh, for instance and and this is just I'm not saying God said this but I, I am saying you know they could not eat of unclean animals they couldn't eat of things that were considered unclean well there was a reason because they didn't have you know they didn't have hot and cold running water they didn't have ways to sanitize that we do in ways that we do today. So, um, you know, they, they couldn't eat shrimp, crawfish. They couldn't eat pork. I know that would really ruin some of you. I'm, I'm a big fan of bacon, you know. Um, uh, you know, and I've had, I have friends who they, they'll say, you know, we, we don't eat pork and we don't eat the things because we're following the, 
diet in the Bible. And, I, and my response to them is, that's great. If, if that's what God has convicted you to do, that's fine. I'm going to have me a piece of ham. Amen. Because he hasn't convicted me of that. If he does, then I'll stop it. But that's not the faith I live by. I live by the faith where, where I can eat and what God has said is clean is not unclean. Okay? Um, but leprosy was, there was a variety of skin diseases considered incurable. And biblically speaking, it also was symbolic, a type or a shadow, or symbolized sin. Because it was something that humanity could not fix. It was beyond their ability. And they're very specific. If you read in Leviticus, there's very specific things that the priests had to look at. Uh, you know, and you can go this, um, you, I mean, very detailed, God gave them. Uh, they said, you know, if there's a white spot on a person and it's white for so many days, you know, they have to go out of the camp and then they have to come back. And if it's changed, I mean, all these rules, not only for uh, leprosy on a person's body, but also on clothing, on houses, on because it, 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 it was something that could be transmitted in uh, many different ways. And the only way that you could really get over it is, is offer sacrifices, pray to God, and ask Him for healing. Um, we also see where in, in the Old Testament, leprosy, God used as punishment sometimes. Not on the average individual, but when, when Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, were upset with Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman, they protested and God struck Miriam with leprosy. And Aaron asked Moses, and he said, you know, please, please ask God, inquire of God that he would heal her. And Moses went to the tabernacle and said, you know, heal her. And God said, if she had spit on her father, or if she had done something objective to her father, she would have been put out for seven days. And so she's got to at least go out for seven days. So, you know, in that regard, it was a punishment. But the cleansing of a leper foreshadowed God's future plan to, cl to cleanse all of mankind from sin. God does not want us to walk in, in an uncurable disease. He doesn't want to live in something that, that so he provided for us. And I'm, I'm talking about sin. He provided for us a, a, a way through his son, Jesus Christ, to not walk in sin, to not be sinners, to not be overcome. I don't know if you've ever uh, studied anything about someone who has leprosy, but it eats away your skin, and it eats away until pieces fall off, joints and limbs and things like that. They just, yeah, you know, we don't see it in our modern society here in the United States a whole lot. But go to a third world country, and there are still places where they deal with. It. I know we went on a we went on a missions trip to the bahamas uh several years ago and when i say that people say oh yeah a missions trip to the bahamas it was a missions trip we ministered to children and we ministered to poor people and they broke us up into groups and one of the guys that had gone on the trip he they took him to a, a gentleman who lived in a hut lived in a hut and he said when he got there the missionary said, I need to go in and I need to help him. He, he's got, he's basically dying. He's sick. And I need to go in. And, and the, man said, the, the man said, well, let me, let me go in. Let me deal with this. Let me do what you would do. And this man from the United States went in. And the missionary said, well, I usually go in and bathe him. He, he's a leper. And I usually help him because he's missing some limbs He's missing some things. And the, the, the story that this gentleman was telling was, you know, he said, I went in and was helping this man who couldn't help himself because of this disease that had caused him to not. And, and I, we asked the question, isn't there something they could do? And the missionary said, well, his condition is too far gone. They really can't help him. We're just trying to ease his suffering. And this person was talking about it and he was crying and he said, you know, this, the, the, it was an awful smell because of decaying flesh. And he would have to go out of the hut and be sick and come back in and minister to this gentleman. And, and you know, it, it, it really brought to the forefront what sin can do. I'm not talking about sin caused his leprosy. But in our life, if we allow sin, it brings decay and destruction. 
And we have to deal with it so that God can bring healing. And the process we see here, why? Because we have a covenant with God through Jesus Christ. But the process that we see here is the leper was brought into the priest in, in Leviticus 14 and 2. And the priest was instructed, now watch this, because we're going to start looking at the type and shadow, the parallel uh, of what was taking place. The priest was instructed to go outside the camp and take with him who is to be cleansed two birds, both of them living. He's also to have some cedar wood, some scarlet, and some hyssop. Okay? You can find that in Leviticus chapter four, uh, 14, verse 4. Now, these are types and shadows of the work. This is a type and shadow of the work of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. Because when we see the priest going outside the camp, taking the leper with him, or actually the leper was supposed to be outside the camp, the priest went outside the camp, we understand that Jesus was crucified outside the city. He was not killed or crucified or offered up within the, the the gates or the walls of the city he was taken out secondly the two birds represented his death and his resurrection because there were two clean birds they were birds that would considered clean could have been a a, a, a dove uh, two doves it could have been two pigeons it could have been just two birds that were considered a clean animals one of them was to be killed the other one was to be set free symbolizing or a type and shadow of christ's death and resurrection Okay, and then we see the cedar, the, the chips of cedar, the cedar wood represents or it points to the cross where he was crucified. The scarlet speaks to his suffering and the hyssop symbolizes the faith in the completed work that Christ was going to do on the cross. The, uh, the psalmist wrote, I believe it was David in Psalm 51 and 7, he said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And if you look back in the, the law of the, uh, the, uh, of the Old Testament, hyssop, and we're going to talk about this for a minute, was very, very much used in the ceremonial cleansing throughout the Old Testament. I think it was mentioned 10 or 12 i think it was 10 times in the old testament i think two or three in the new testament where we we see a record of the word hyssop or you know hyssop is a uh, uh it's an herb but it's not like it's a flowering flowering herb but it grows typically they would plant it along a wall okay exodus 12 and 22 the significance of hyssop because when they were in egypt and they were getting ready to come out they were told to to kill the passover lamb or we call it the paschal lamb and the, the the head of the house was to catch some of the blood of that lamb when it was killed in a bowl or a basin it was to take that bowl or basin and they were to take hyssop again this herb and they were to dip it in that bowl and they were to strike the doorposts and the lentil or the top post during the Passover to cause the angel of God to pass over and spare the firstborn in that house. And so we see that hyssop is uh, used, uh, 12 and 22, you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, strike the lentil and the two doorposts. Uh, with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning they were covered by the blood that was applied by the hyssop that's why it represents our faith because you apply the blood of jesus christ in faith we don't literally apply blood but we do literally apply the blood of jesus christ in faith to our loved ones, to our home, to our health, to our finances, to the things that we have submitted to God because we are in a blood covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And it is His blood, the blood of that covenant, that protects us, that keeps us, that, that, that uh, watches over us. And so hyssop is one of the better known plants in the Bible referred to in ten places. Uh, two in the New Testament, ten in the Old and uh, it was an important part of Passover. It was, it was ceremonial cleansing for skin disease. It was also used in the red heifer offering, which is also, and that's Numbers 19, a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ, and then Psalm 51 and 7. Now in the New Testament, we can see it in John 19 and 29. 
John 19 and 29 is where Jesus is hanging on the cross. And they're wanting to offer him some sour vinegar or sour wine. And they, they get it on the sponge. But listen, the way they carried a sponge in the Old Testament in, the, in Jewish times was to wrap it in this her herb called hyssop. So as not to touch the sponge or contaminate whatever was in the sponge with their fingers or their hand, they would wrap it in this hyssop. And so this sponge wrapped in hyssop would have been offered to the Lord. Now, uh, we know that he, he did not take it. And then the next time it's used in the New Testament is in uh, uh, Hebrews. I just lost my place. Hebrews 9, 19, and it refers to the ceremonial cleansing of the children of Israel, and it mentions hyssop. Now, if you go to Leviticus chapter 14, back to our text in verses 5 and 6, it says that the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Now, when I first read this when I was a youngster, the picture I got in my mind, because I always, when I'm reading, I'm, your mind develops pictures, or at least mine does. As I'm reading this, I saw this earthen vessel and this bird in this earthen vessel and the priest killed it and there's water running over it to spread the blood. But that's not the way it, they're to be over running water. He doesn't say water running over it. He says they're to do over running water. So over a, a stream, a creek, or a somewhere where there was running water. I don't know if it was artificial where they were pouring water out and it was running. But it said that one of the birds is to be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Maybe they were pouring it out. I don't know. I, I believe that the water symbolizes the act of the Holy Spirit in the process of, of the... Uh, uh, the, the blood covenant also we we know that jesus said i am the living water he told the woman at the well that whoever drinks from me will never thirst again and so you know we see these types and shadows and we try to gain understanding as for the living bird verse six he shall take it now watch this the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and he'll dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. Now, I studied on that for a while. Now, first of all, the, the, this bird is killed, the one that dies is killed in an earthen vessel. It's, it's sacrificed, literally, for this, this leper who's been cleansed. Sacrificed in the... How many of you know that Jesus was in, was in an earthen vessel? Because we're made of clay. This human body was sculpted out of clay. And you may say, well, no, no, I come out of my mother. Yeah, but you come out of your mother who came out of her mother who came out of her mother and you take it all the way back and it goes back to Noah and then it goes back to Adam and Eve who were sculpted out of the clay because we are made of dirt. Okay, this, this physical body is an earthen vessel. And Jesus had to come in the earthen vessel so, to become one of us so that he could fulfill the law and become that supreme sacrifice for us. So this bird is offered up in this earthen vessel. The blood is captured in this earthen vessel. And this other bird, and the now again, if you look at this on its face value, you're thinking, why a bird? Why cedar wood? Why hyssop? Why scarlet? Why has all this stuff got to be dipped in blood? What's the purpose? It's a type and a shadow. Because if you go to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, these are all active. Now, not the bird, but... The things that we're seeing, the, the cross made of cedar, the, the robe that they wouldn't cut, that they gambled for. It's interesting how this has taken place 4,000 years before it happens, and we're getting a picture of it. The hyssop that's involved with the offering of the sour wine and then that bird that's been dipped in the blood has been set free <clears throat> okay yeah some of you need to soar because you're not the bird that died you're the bird that was dipped in the blood 
The bird that died was Jesus Christ. He was the, that's the type in the shadow. It, it also shows the, the death and resurrection because the death couldn't hold him. Okay? And so this blood was caught in an earthen vessel, speaks to the Christ shedding his blood in an earthen body. Priest took the living bird, the cedar wood, represents the cross, scarlet, his suffering, his faith, he dipped them in the shed blood of the final bird. Now look at verse 7 in Leviticus 14. He shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. Okay, so, you know, I'm wondering, you know, I'm not a numerologist. I don't look at the Bible and, and try to put everything with numbers. And there are people who do that. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I just, I, I like math, but not that much. Not that much to study it out like that. But I like math, but, I, you know, not, not to the extent that it takes to take, a, a, you know, every number in the alphabet and it's got a number and then you try to figure out this and that. But, but there are some numbers in the Bible that are very significant. And one of them is the number seven. And we know what number seven represents. Number se seven represents the day of completion or rest because on the seventh day he rested. Okay? We call it the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, under the law, they had to serve God on the Sabbath and do nothing else. In the New Testament, it changed. You know, I know I've known people who they're Seventh Day Adventists, or there are people who believe that we ought to worship on Saturday because Saturday is the seventh day. Sunday is the first day of the week. We don't worship on Saturday because of the Sabbath. We worship because in the New Testament, the disciples, disciples gathered together on what they called the Lord's Day because that's the day He rose, okay, from the, from the dead. And so that's just been when we worship and when we come together. It, it, uh, we're going to have, in, in January, we're going to have our, our Sunday of prayer, the first Sunday in January, a Sunday of prayer like we did this last year. We're going to have our Sunday of praise. We're going to have our Sunday of first fruits where we, we want everybody to give a first fruit offering on your part for you. But it's going to be much more than the offering this year. We're going to talk about the offering, but we're going to talk much more about what it means, the true first fruits. Because if we're really giving our first fruits to God that first day of the week, does it really belong to God? Ooh, it's quiet. I'm not talking about you can't go out and do any work. I'm just saying, are you giving the first fruits of your week to God? Are you giving the first fruits of every day to God? You know, if we don't give God the first fruits, we can find ourselves in trouble. In the Old Testament, under the law, the first fruits was the firstborn son of every family. Had to be redeemed. There was a redeem, uh, a cost of redemption. According to the temple shekels, you had to pay so much. And I find it interesting that th there was a woman in the Bible who said to God, she couldn't bear children, Lord, if you'll just give me a son, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. And her firstborn son was Samuel. And he was her firstfruits. And she had five or six more children after that. What she was saying is this, he'll be dedicated to your service. You see, we really need to understand what it means to do the work of first fruits. Jesus Christ, his resurrection was our first fruits. Amen. We get to enjoy what he's, he has won for us or, or purchased for us, not won, but purchased. So the priest took the living bird with the cedar wood, which is the cross, the scarlet, his suffering, hyssop was his faith. He dipped him in the shed blood and the bird of the bird that was slain. Then he sprinkled it seven times. We're talking about the numbers. You know, number seven. And, and you can see this in different places, the number seven having significance. As for this leper, they were to dip that blood in there and sprinkle it on a man who, or the individual who's to be cleansed seven times. Again, from the standpoint of Genesis, it's a number of completion, meaning that work, that, that atonement, that healing was complete. But it also shows us something else. It speaks to the sins of being cleansed by the blood. Okay, so 
if you look at the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I, I feel like I need to put this here. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed seven times during the crucifixion process. From the garden in Gethsemane, Gethsemane, he sweat great drops of blood, Luke 22 and 44. His, his beard was plucked out. We can read about it in Isaiah prophetically, 50 and 6. We know it took place. The third thing was his head, the crown of thorns, Matthew 27, verses 29 through 30. They struck him, they beat him, they placed the crown of thorns. The fourth time was when the, he took the stripes on his back, Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, where he was lashed with a cat of nine tails, left bloodied and broken. We also know it prophetically in Psalms 22 and 16 that he was going to be pierced in his hands. Now I'm going to tell you, you can't drive a nail through someone's hands and them not bleed. They also put a nail for number six through his feet as he hung on that cross and the final one that was psalms 22 and 16 as well prophetically in john 19 and 34 the roman soldier took a spear and thrust it into his side and the bible says that blood and water came out that he was dead they didn't have to break his bones because he was already dead so these seven times we see the shed blood of jesus christ And I've asked myself, why, why reference or why these seven times where we, we see that the blood was shed from this body of this man, this who was man and who was also God? Because he's trying to bring into completion everything that needs to be done. He's not trying. He's bringing into completion everything that was done or necessary for you and I to walk in, king, to walk in kingdom life and kingdom victory. I don't have time to go into it, but every, every area of those where he sweat, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed humanity. Because in the garden, Adam was cursed. He was cursed with the sweat of his brow. Jesus is shedding blood from the sweat of his brow. Great, he sweat great drops of blood. Do you think that God didn't redeem the curse through His Son right there in that moment? I'm not cursed when I do work. Mm -mm. Not if I'm walking and living in kingdom life. And let me tell you something else. When that blood hit the ground, it redeemed the earth that every believer walks on. Whew. Ooh, I, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. It didn't redeem the whole world from the standpoint of everybody saved. But everywhere my feet go, it's redeemed. Everywhere your feet tread, it's redeemed. Because you carry the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ in faith. And you can laugh at this. I'm going to testify. I'm going to tell you. And I believe it's true. I believe everywhere we go... We carry the blessing of the Lord with us. Gene, Gene and I went grow, uh, uh, Christmas shopping this, earlier this week. We went to some of the stores up on 20, the, out, the outlets up there. And we walked in. The first store we walked in, it, there was a few people. It wasn't very crowded. We were in there maybe three or four minutes. Turned around and it was packed. You couldn't hardly move. I couldn't hardly move around in there. It was full. Now, you might just say people are, it's just because people are Christmas shopping. No, there wasn't any, hardly anybody in the area. They just all showed up in that store. We made a purchase. We left. We went to another store. Went in. I, I, I look around at how many people's in the store. Not because I'm afraid, not because of COVID. I've done this just to, my dad taught, he, was, he always hammered in us. Know your surroundings. Be aware. You don't want to be caught off guard. The longer that we were there, the more people showed up. And I'm going to tell you, I believe because it's a blessing of God. 
on us so that not they're following us, but that this place is being blessed because we're there. Not because we're buying. We bought merchandise, but not that we weren't spending a whole lot. But more people came in. You, you might disagree with it. That's fine. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to believe it. But I believe everywhere a, a redeemed, a blood-bought believer walks, the land, the ground that you walk on is redeemed because the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is that strong. It's called kingdom life. Now listen, if you don't have the hyssop, you ain't going to believe it. You ain't going to walk in it. And I'm not talking about going out and getting the plant. I'm talking about your faith. We see the resurrection in the bird, a living bird being released, being set free. The old covenant foreshadows the new covenant. Colossians 2 verse 16. Colossians 2, 16 says, So let no one judge you in food or drink or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. Now, I want to stop right there because, man, we put laws on people in the church, say you got to do it this way or you got to do it that way. And, and, and Paul was saying, look, don't let people put you in a box or put God in a box. Now, you understand, sin is sin and it's wrong. You can't justify it in any shape, form, or fashion. But just because you do something differently, if it's not sin against God, it doesn't make it wrong. Hello. Ooh, glory. Hallelujah. Give me an example, Pastor Kurt. Okay, I will. I'll give you an example. You won't ever find me. I won't say ever. You will probably never find me waving a flag or a banner in a church service. Not, not because I think it's wrong. And not because I disagree with it. It's just not the way I worship. But I'm going to tell you something. We, we have had, now you might find Gina waving the banner because she likes that. And that's all right. Because we're different people and we worship differently. And it's okay. And if she were to look at me and say, well, he just ain't worshiping. He needs to, he needs to get it on the ball because he just ain't worshiping at all. Well, that's not right. And if I was saying, man, she's a little bit loony. And she almost hit. <laughs> she's here, so she knows. She's back there in the back waving that flag. And she almost hit Brian and Susan on a Sunday morning. So she needs to put that down because it's not right. That's, that's what he's talking about. Don't let anybody put you in a box. It's all about Jesus Christ. Again, our worship needs to glorify him, not get people to look at us. However you do it. But the bottom line is if that's the way you worship, then you need to make sure your heart's right and you are worshiping with everything that you have. Hebrews 10, verse 1. It says, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of things, meaning this, it was shadowing, it was telling us what was coming, but it wasn't the good thing. It, it, it limited us, but when Jesus came, it changed. He says, which are the shadow of things to come, but the, uh, excuse me, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect and so he was saying in hebrews that the the sacrifice of the animals it wasn't good enough he goes on to say the sacrifice of jesus christ was perfect and complete and enough it was perfect his sacrifice was complete and his sacrifice is enough for whatever sin for whatever issue for whatever is causing you your dilemma, his sacrifice was enough. He, he, he doesn't need to, sh no, no more blood needs to be shed. You just need to walk in faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Seven times. Seven times they were sprinkled. Those seven sprinkles brought life. 
Huh? I'll give you another place where the number seven brings life. It's, it's a story in the Old Testament where the prophet was traveling by. I don't remember if it was Elijah or Elisha. And he would stop into this house with this, this woman and her husband. And she told her husband, she said, let's build him a room. He comes by. When he comes by, let's build him a room so he can stay here and we'll feed him and we'll take care of the man of God. She didn't ask for nothing. He didn't have, the, 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 uh, the husband didn't ask for nothing. So he looks at the wife and says, what do you want? What do you need? And she didn't have any children. I want a son. I like a son. She didn't ask for it. it the prophet came to her. I, again, I don't remember if it was Elijah or Elisha. The boy's five, six, seven, eight years old. He's out with his father in the field. And he says, my head hurts. And he says, go to your mother. Goes to his mother. Goes in the house. He dies. She saddles up her mode of transportation, her donkey. And she heads to the prophet. She, the, her husband sees her on the way and says, all right, what's wrong? You all right? No, I'm good. She gets to the prophet. She sends word or something anyway. Yeah, sends word to the prophet or calls for the prophet and he tries to send his servant and she said no i don't want the servant i want the prophet and the prophet comes along and says everything good she said everything's good come on to my house comes to to her house and when he gets there she says my son the son that i didn't ask for the son that you blessed me with the son that god gave me has died and i'm here with a broken heart now, the, the next part is a little strange. As he goes in and he lays himself on that child. And he prays. And he lays himself on that child and he prays. And watch this. If you, you can miss this if you don't see it. The boy sneezed seven times and then came to life. His life was restored. Now, I told you that story because of that, about that number seven. Not only do we see it as a number of completion but it's a number of life because that leper was sprinkled. That blood was sprinkled seven times and then he who needed to be clean or is cleansed, clean is cleansed. You see, it's a number of God's perfection. Perfection isn't found in us. Our number is six, the number of man. We were created on the sixth day. We're imperfect, but his son came and he shed his blood seven times, not six times, but seven times. And now we have life and that more abundantly. Now we have life and that eternal through Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our strength. Now because he shed his blood on that cross and in that process seven different times represented here in the cleansing of the leper. It was that spiritual life giving force. And our faith in it. You see, the blood was on the hyssop, faith, as he sprinkled it. Seven times. That faith. There's another, there's another one. It came to me, man. I'm remembering these old Sunday school stories. There's a man by the name of Naaman. Yeah. He was a, he was a general or a, an official in the army of someone not from Israel. He had leprosy, and this little servant girl said, hey, there's a prophet in the land of Israel. He, he, can, he speaks to God, and he can, he can heal you. And so he goes, pulls up in his two-toned white wall chariot, and knocks on the door of the prophet. And the prophet doesn't come to the door, but his servant. And he says, I want to speak to the prophet. And the servant says, just a minute. Doesn't even invite him in. Just a minute. Stay right here. Goes back to the prophet and says, there's a man. Yeah, I know. Well, he's here because, yes, I know. Well, what do you want me to do? Tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll be clean. And the servant walks back to the door and says, my master says, go dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll be clean of your leprosy. He had leprosy. And shut the door. Now I'm going to tell you, when you're a man of importance and a peon shuts the door in your face, 
you're not in a good mood. You're accustomed to seeing the head person, not a servant. So he jumped back in his two-tone chariot with white wall wheels and started heading back to his land. But his servant on the way said, if it had asked you to do a difficult thing, would you not have done it? Well, yes. But the rivers in our land are so much pretty and prettier and clearer and cleaner than this old muddy piece of Jordan. But why not give it a try? So the Bible says he stopped his chariot, he got out, and he walked. He took off his pride, and he stepped into the water. And he dipped. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh time when he came up, he didn't have it anymore. You see, at number seven, that's speaking life. Because it's the number of God. And the number of completion, of fulfillment. The leper was then allowed to come back into the camp. In Leviticus chapter 14 verse 8. He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside his tent seven days. You see, when we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. A blood that is complete. A sacrifice that is perfect. We don't have to do anything else. Now, we should have good works, but our good works don't produce what we need. Our faith in what He did produces what we need. He produced what we needed. We just have to step into it and walk in that cleansing. Because, hear this, it is the blood of of the covenant of Jesus Christ. And when we step into that, we are we become sons and daughters of the most high. Now again, I believe if you're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed by him, walking with the same spirit that raised him from the dead that re- resides within you, everywhere you go, you're walking in redemption and blessing. Everywhere you set your foot, every house you step into, you carry it with you. They may not want you there. They may not want it there. But it is there because it comes with you and I. We need to start exercising that, living in it, moving in it, breathing in it. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. I'm going to ask you just to lift your hands right now. I'm going to ask you just to say, Lord, help me to walk in that kingdom life, to to walk in the, the completeness and the perfection of the blood of Jesus Christ who has redeemed me from my sin. I stand in covenant relationship with you through the blood of Jesus. I accept it. Lord, I move in blessing, not only for my life, but for those that I walk around, those places I walk into, this earth that I set my feet on. The enemy will not usurp my authority, but I will walk in the covenant blessing and the kingdom covenant relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We give you glory and honor and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Would you just... Give him a clap offering of praise right now. He is worthy. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to encourage you to be here Sunday morning uh, at 930 for our uh, adult Bible study. Uh, Bill and Denise Crumpton be here at 1030 for morning worship. Um, Wear your t-shirts. If you hadn't got one, there's still some out there. We haven't uh, gotten our double X and triple X. But if you want one, if you'll let me know, we'll get them delivered before Sunday. So uh, they're supposed to be here tomorrow or Friday, so we'll get them to you. We want you to wear your T-shirts if you've got them. God bless you. Go with God, and thank you for being here.